Hi everyone, Brian here wishing you a great Monday and a wonderful week ahead. In our series here, we've been looking at Holy Scripture as it is a resource for comprehending and reflecting on the nature of the human soul, which uh, we have access to in what I call the deep self, which is found, you know, it's selfhood and everything else happens in the brain, but we can think of it as happening deep within us. Uh, we all have an everyday self that's very busy, uh, that manages our life, that reflects on all of the input that comes right at us all the time. Uh, we even use that everyday self when we go to church. It's the one that listens to the lessons, responds to what the preacher says, uh, it, it is active in terms of how we get through the service. It's also the part of our church life that says, uh, what am I going to do with my Christianity? How does Christianity interact with the world around me? That's all the everyday self at work. Uh, but there is also a deep self. And uh, in the 21st century, it's really important to reaccess and trust that this uh, deep soulfulness within is significant and important, understood, embraced, and becomes part of our life. If not, um, there's, a, there's a real chance that secular humanism uh, will plow over the reality of the soul and continue to um, sort of erode away at uh, its participation in our everyday lives. Uh, the everyday self is quite willing and interested in having an interaction with the deep self, but it can get lost in the busyness of the everydayness of our lives. Now, this is not to say that scripture does uh, not provide the history or the story of the people of faith, or that uh, the scriptures aren't telling us about the theology of how God relates to people, and people ought to relate back to God. The soul is something that we look at because it gives us a sense of the meaning, the beauty, the zest, uh, uh, the depth of life. And uh, we trust that that's a real thing, that beauty is real, that uh, joy is real, that hope is real that these have uh, truths that uh, aren't found uh, simply in the psychosocial dynamic of who we are as human beings. Uh, we've been doing this by looking at certain characters in scripture, and uh, most recently we've been looking at the person of John the Baptist. Uh, our theory is that each of the gospel writers uh, Again, yes, they want to tell the story of the people of God. They want to tell the amazing uh, truth of what God did in the incarnation of Jesus. They want to reflect on the nature of what the Messiah is all about in the messianic age that Jesus inaugurated. They want to tell us all of those things. They also want to pass on the teaching of Jesus, how to behave as a Christian, and all of that sort of thing. Uh, but we also hold to the idea here that the scriptures are also, and the gospel stories in particular, are giving us the interior experience of the living word of God bubbling up into uh, consciousness, into the everyday self. And that in fact, what Jesus says and means by faith is this interconnection between the everydayness of our lives, the things that command our attention, both the things we're grateful for because they go well and the problems and issues or ugliness of life that we have to overcome, uh, and how the deep self or the voice of the soul interacts with that. So we've been looking at how the various gospel writers approach um, the story and the person of John the Baptist. Today we're going to look at one aspect of how St. Luke, uh, or the author of Luke, has done this. So I'm going to read you a passage from the uh, third chapter of Luke's Gospel. Uh, interestingly enough, it's a way in which the author of Luke's Gospel is quoting uh, a Hebrew prophet, in this case Isaiah. 
uh, in reference to the mission and ministry of John the Baptist, uh, but we're going to again look at it as uh, what is this gospel writer telling us about how soulfulness works. So um, uh, the author starts by uh, speaking of John as one who went all through the country around the Jordan River, preaching a baptism of life change leading to forgiveness of sins, as described in the words of Isaiah the prophet. Thunder in the desert. Prepare God's arrival. Make the road smooth and straight. Every ditch will be filled in, every bump smoothed out, the detours straightened out, all the ruts paved over. Everyone will be there to see the parade of God's salvation. Uh, this is a pretty well-known uh, passage from Isaiah. Christians certainly know it. It's uh, made it into uh, Handel's Messiah. Um, it's, you know, sort of familiar to us all. Uh, the recommendation I want us to think about, though, today is how does this tell us something about the nature of the soul? And uh, what I want to suggest to you is that the soul is one that does pierce through uh, all of the kinds of constraints and problems and blockades that our everyday self sets up for itself. Uh, that uh, we, we can't often see our way through problems, uh, issues seem to overwhelm us, uh, we see constraints that we have to wind our way around, um, and sometimes we have psychosocial uh, blocks that just keep us from even imagining that there's a solution to certain problems. Uh, now, of course, in the realm of sociology, anthropology, social history, and uh, the psychology of, the, of what goes on inside of us, uh, the same thing happens. I mean, there, we all have what uh, we now call paradigm shifts when all of a sudden we've been struggling with an issue, struggling with an issue, struggling with an issue. And all of a sudden, uh, the door opens and we can see a way through, it becomes clear and evident. Uh, we wonder, as a matter of fact, once we walk through that door, how it was ever a problem in the first place. It feels glorious, it feels simple and straightforward. There are lots of examples of these. Uh, I'm going to choose one uh, primarily for fun, um, but that I think exemplifies uh, this issue. Uh, throughout the 20th century, the relationship between men and women uh, went through a radical shift. At the beginning of the 20th century, uh, while there were certainly individuals who probably had pierced through this understanding, pretty much everyone in culture authentically believed that uh, men were uh, superior to women. Not only could they run faster or punch harder, uh, they had uh, faster, more effective brains. Their uh, masculine personality was intended to be both dominant and uh, in charge. And uh, uh, women bought this as much as men. It was certainly uh, proven from scripture in all sorts of insidious ways. Uh, and it was a presupposition. Women had very little standing in the community. They couldn't manage their own finances very successfully. Institutions uh, kept them out. They obviously couldn't vote. Um, and they were expected to uh, uh, maintain uh, a, a small stamp in terms of their relationship with the world outside of the home. By the end of the 20th century, we had uh, around the world many women who were heads of state, heads of uh, businesses and organizations, heads of universities and colleges. Uh, women had, uh, though they still struggle in this uh, century and the work is far from done, uh, had achieved equality in a great many ways. Um, uh, their, uh, they, the women's movement had overcome uh, much of the prejudice that had oppressed and kept them down. Uh, 
literally for hundreds if not thousands of years. Uh, that movement uh, is uh, in large measure what Isaiah is talking about here. Uh, we had a whole culture that, that uh, couldn't find a straight way for women to exercise the fullness of their uh, capabilities, their interests. Uh, they, were, they were constrained and blocked in. Um, I'd like to look at it through a character that was developed by comedian Jackie Gleason in the 1950s in a show called The Honeymooners. His character was Ralph Cramden. Ralph Cramden was a working class guy who really wanted to embrace this um, hope and idea that men should be the master of their own households, that their wives should be there to support and nurture them in whatever crazy venture uh, they wanted to go on. And if only uh, they could uh, convince uh, the women in their lives to be supportive, then they would have all the nurture and energy and resources they personally needed to make anything they wanted of their lives. Uh, this show came in the mid middle of the uh, 20th century and in the midst of this transition and I think the show was largely about this battle of the sexes as it was called back then and poor Ralph uh, was always getting himself into messes, never being able to achieve what he wanted, often blaming his wife uh, for the fact that he was not a success. Uh, but almost in every episode, he would come to a point of recognizing how faithful and true and decent and good his wife was, and how often her intelligence, her insight, her um, uh, hard work uh, had uh, made the best of the situation that he had largely screwed up. And so there would be this often gentle moment uh, in a show when Ralph would recognize uh, how important uh, his wife had been. In my view, that Ralph Cramden character gets repeated over and over and over again. Uh, there's two cartoons, uh, one in Bedrock uh, in the Stone Age with Fred Flintstone, one in the future with George Jetson. Um, there was Archie Bunker and Sanderson and Son, uh, in which there were working class, but one white, one black guy. Same character, same struggle to maintain this image of the guy who's in charge of his whole life. Ralph Cramden uh, actually continues to be available on television today uh, with um, a variety of men uh, struggling with the issue of what it means to share uh, their lives with competent, able, good uh, women. So there is a cultural recognition of uh, how contorted we can make our lives uh, when we are um, constrained by a belief structure that gets in the way of the purity and goodness of what is right and just and decent. Uh, and how good it is in those moments that appear in all of these television shows uh, when this guy recognizes finally, uh, perhaps just for a moment, uh, the beauty of sharing his life uh, and his work and his aspirations uh, with a life partner. Uh, now, th these are all situation comedies and um, uh, I use it because uh, sometimes it is this lighthearted way in which, and through comedy, that we can address some of these issues. What makes John the Baptist unique in this is his understanding that this process of, of shifting from, you know, struggling against uh, a, a new insight, a new victorious way to live life broader, deeper, better, more nurturing, uh, th that we, we create all these constraints in our head. Uh, but it's John's awareness that it is God's um, work to make this path easier for us, and that these moments actually occur, and that it is the work of the Spirit of the Divine that makes it happen, and that we can see these moments in our lives when all of a sudden we have clarity and we can see something that's better and easier, uh, uh, deeper and richer for us. 
Uh, the question is, will we trust it? Will we build our lives on it? And that's what John the Baptist uh, is saying spiritually or soulfully as he speaks to the disciples that gather at the Jordan River. Pierce through and let God make straight the paths within you. Um, uh, it's, it's sort of like um, learning to, again, floss your teeth or do rehab after surgery, that it may seem that you're uh, working at, at odds with what you want to do in the moment or the way your brain or your everyday self tells you you want to spend your time and energy. Uh, but that it's for your health and wholeness, and it's quite simple, and, and the doors uh, can open for you. So there is this constant mo movement in our lives of providing straight pathways, uh, um, taking out the bumps and, and valleys of life that make it seem like uh, it, that our journey through life is such a struggle. Uh, and it allows us to gently open up and realize that life is actually quite simple if we allow ourselves uh, to comprehend the grace of God at work in our lives. One of the prayers that gets to this comes uh, not from Christianity, but from the Alcoholics Anonymous movement. It's famous in that uh, movement. It's called the Serenity Prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. If we go backwards through that, it's this wisdom that um, uh, John the Baptist is inviting us into, to be able to look around the world and say, what is the work that I'm really having to work on? What, what's my challenge? What, what are the... Um, issues that I have to face and that I can do. But then what are all these other things that I'm worried about or constrained about or vying against over which I have no control? And, and if I was to stand back and simply see how they work themselves out, I would see life in a much simpler way. Uh, so rather than thinking of John the Baptist as this fiery guy who's out like a, a tent uh, modern tent evangelist saying, you know, here are your sins, you better confess them and, and get rid of them. I think we can look at least uh, as a secondary way of looking at John the Baptist as inviting us into this same journey that uh, people seeking health and wholeness after addiction can do by saying, let me have the wisdom and the insight to see God's grace at, the world, of, at work in the world Yes, there are some things I'm called to work on and to make changes. But there are a lot of things in this world that I, I have no control over and I can't make the changes there. And if I could stand back and look, I would see that um, all of the constraints and bends in the road and ups and downs that I'm imposing on it uh, are there only because I want to control and manage it and can't. Uh, so, uh, I encourage us to, uh, as we think about John the Baptist and his invitation to, this is the doorway of the living Word of God, to actually make use of the centering prayer. I mean, uh, not the centering prayer, the, um, um, the Alcoholics Awareness, the Alcoholics Anonymous uh, Serenity Prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. God grant me the courage to change the things I can, and God grant me the wisdom to know the difference. Uh, so have some fun with that uh, and see how, that script, how Scripture might invite us uh, to a much richer interpretation of stories that we've known for a long time. Enjoy your week. Thanks for listening, and God bless.